tonight. Yunus takes charge. Nobel laureate Muhammad Yunus is sworn in under Bangladesh's chaotic government with hopes of returning the country to normalcy. Meeting in the pit. The Israeli cabinet convenes for emergency meetings as the manhunt for the new Hamas leader intensifies. Down to debate. Trump and Harris prepare to face off at the upcoming presidential debates with Trump egging on the Democratic camp for more in the future. Rituals for unity. The Edinburgh International Festival gears up with themes of togetherness through rituals. All that and more as World is Tonight starts right now. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in for tonight's edition of World News on our final bulletin for the week. Major stories that broke throughout the week saw new developments tonight. From the US presidential election to Venezuela's political unrest. But we start off with yet more updates from neighbouring Bangladesh. Nobel Peace Laureate Muhammad Yunus took charge of Bangladesh's caretaker government, hoping to help heal the country rocked by weeks of violence that forced Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina to quit and flee to neighbouring India. Welcomed as a saviour in his country, Muhammad Yunus now faces many challenges. The head of Bangladesh's interim government is expected to restore calm. He'll have to first shed light on the clashes between police and protesters, which left over 450 people dead, and quell the anger that has risen against the Bangladeshi police, who apologised for firing on crowds of demonstrators, going on strike Tuesday until their security can be assured. The judiciary will also come under scrutiny for its past record of convicting opposition officials and activists, with protesters demanding that the former Prime Minister and her allies be brought to justice. Security will be a major challenge for the interim government as rights groups warn of attacks on religious minorities like Hindus, seen by some as allies of the former Prime Minister's party. They've had their temples attacked, businesses and homes torched by mobs wanting to take revenge. The role of the army during this interim period has yet to be determined. Its head appointed Muhammad Yunus to lead the government, but the question remains just how freely he will be able to govern. Yunus aims to bring back democracy, which can only happen through free elections. Though Bangladesh's economy is growing at over 6%, the unrest has shaken its garment industry, which accounts for 85% of the country's annual exports. Violence forced factories to close and garment orders to stop. Inequalities in the country also remain high, with NGOs reporting that one in two people lives on less than a dollar a day. India's Supreme Court has granted bail to a prominent opposition leader of Delhi's governing Aam Admi Party in a money laundering case. The top court said Mani Sisodia's prolonged incarceration had violated his right to a speedy trial. Mrs. Sisodia has been in jail for more than 17 months in a case related to alleged irregularities in a now scrapped legal policy in the city. He denies the corruption allegations and had challenged his arrest in court. The court said the right to a quick trial was sacrosanct and that if the state or an agency fail to protect it, then bail cannot be opposed, saying the crime is serious. The judges added that since Mrs. Sodia's trial was unlikely to be completed soon, it would be a violation of his rights to keep him imprisoned indefinitely. Updates on the war in Israel now. Israel's security cabinet held a meeting underground as part of its emergency training. The Israeli military continued its airstrikes throughout Gaza this time killing at least 40 Palestinians. Amid fears of a massive Iranian retaliatory attack against Israel for the killing of a Hamas leader and a top Hezbollah commander, the Israeli security cabinet held a meeting at an underground bunker known as the pit on Thursday night. Despite rumors that the meeting took place at the underground command room over fears of an Iranian strike, Israel says the event was a drill for a potential emergency situation. Located under the security ministry's headquarters, the last time such a meeting took place at the pit was in April, when Iran responded to an Israeli attack on its embassy in Syria by firing hundreds of drones and missiles toward Israeli targets. Meanwhile, amid an escalation in tensions in the Middle East, Israel is continuing to conduct airstrikes throughout Gaza, killing at least 40 Palestinians. This includes airstrikes at a cluster of houses at Al-Baraj camp, where at least 15 were killed, 
and a nearby camp where four others were killed. The two camps are considered some of the more densely populated areas in the region, but are also seen by Israel as strongholds for Hamas. The Israeli military also struck two schools east of Gaza, killing 15 Palestinians. Israel says it conducted airstrikes at Hamas military targets. Since last October, close to 40,000 Palestinians have been killed and more than 90,000 others injured. We move to the conflict in Ukraine now. Russian forces were battling Ukrainian troops for a third day after they smashed through the Russian border in the Kursk region, an audacious attack on the world's biggest nuclear power that has forced Moscow to call in reserves. Drone footage released by the Ukrainian military purports to show Russian forces surrendering at a border crossing. Speaking on Thursday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said, quote, everyone can see that the Ukrainian army knows how to surprise and knows how to achieve results. He did not directly reference the Kursk offensive. Russian President Vladimir Putin cast the attack as a, quote, major provocation. Was the White House made aware prior to... No. The White House said the United States, Ukraine's biggest backer, had no prior knowledge of the attack and would seek more details from Kyiv. Washington has cautioned Ukraine against striking into Russian territory, fearing it could escalate the conflict. In a televised interview on Thursday, Ukrainian presidential adviser Mikhailo Podolyak did not directly address the offensive, but said such maneuvers were both necessary and lawful for a nation under attack. International law clearly states that a country waging defensive war has a legal right to execute strikes regardless of how deep certain infrastructure is in the enemy territory. We have a legal right to destroy everything regardless of the distance, be it 100 kilometers, 10 kilometers or 1,000 kilometers deep into Russian Federation territory. This is a legally correct action. The operation comes at what could be a critical juncture in the conflict. Kiev is concerned that U.S. support could drop off if Republican Donald Trump wins the November presidential election. Trump has said he would end the war, and both Russia and Ukraine are keen to gain the strongest possible bargaining position on the battlefield. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. And on the road to the White House, Donald Trump and his Democratic opponent Kamala Harris have agreed to a debate. Set for September 10th on ABC, it will be the first face-to-face matchup between the rivals in what polls show is an extremely close race. After backing out from a debate with Kamala Harris, Donald Trump has taken on the challenge again, agreeing to face the vice president on an ABC News debate on September 10th. It will be their first face-to-face -face matchup in what polls shows a very tight presidential race. She hasn't done an interview. She can't do an interview. She's barely competent, and she can't do an interview. But I look forward to the debates because I think we have to set the record straight. The 81-year-old billionaire flitted multiple subjects as he addressed the media, criticizing his new opponent. Kamala Harris, whose rapid rise has sent Trump's team scrambling to step up its strategy, is currently on a tour of the battleground states like Pennsylvania, Michigan and Arizona, landing in Phoenix on Thursday, ahead of a Friday campaign event. Well, I'm glad that he's finally agreed to a debate on September 10th. I'm looking forward to it and um, hope he shows up. Since Biden bowed out of the elections, the presidential race has picked up pace as Kamala Harris's campaign appears to be gaining more followers and donations. The vice president recently chose Minnesota Governor Tim Walz as her new running mate, hoping to further strengthen her chances in Midwestern states. There's fresh updates on the attempt on Trump's life. New release video captures police confronting the gunman moments before he opened fire at Donald Trump at a rally, as well as the chaos that followed as authorities raced to locate the shooter. 
This is the moment police in Butler, Pennsylvania, first confront the gunman who opened fire on former President Trump. An officer is hoisted to the roof, sees the shooter, and falls back to the ground. The body camera audio starts moments later. This close, bro. Do he turn around on me? He's straight up. Heavily armed police race toward the building. Next, 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 next. Some scaling this plastic shed to reach the roof. The officer who confronted the shooter describing what he saw. He's got a boot bag. He's got mad. AOR laying down. He's got. Yeah, he's got. He's laying down, prone out, book bag next to him. But watch out, cause he can come right down on you over there. Those officers scrambling to locate the shooter. This building. He was on top of this building. The left one. Finding him after several tense minutes. By then, the gunman, 20-year-old Thomas Crooks, is dead. One in custody, HR building south, rooftop. Another officer's body camera capturing a wounded victim carried from the rally site. When the chaos subsides, some police openly question how the shooter had access to a rooftop 400 feet from the former president. I told him to post guys over here. I wasn't even concerned about it because I thought someone was on the roof. Huh. I thought that's how we, like, how else can you lose a guy walking back here? They were, they were, on the roof. They were inside. Why were we not in the building? Why were we not on the roof? Still in the U.S., Tropical Depression Debbie is making its second landfall in South Carolina, spawning a deadly tornado and flood watches from South Carolina to New York. Tonight, as Debbie marches up the East Coast, the death toll is rising and the roads are treacherous. Overnight on Highway 74, west of Wilmington, North Carolina. Take a deep breath. Um, I'm okay. Storm chasers and other drivers, including a Marine veteran, springing into action racing to rescue a woman after her car hydroplaned and flipped over, carefully guiding her out of harm's way. Debbie blowing ashore just north of Charleston, its second landfall, tropical torrential rain inundating neighborhoods. East of Raleigh in Lucama, North Carolina, this middle school taking a direct hit from a confirmed tornado. First responders searching the classrooms inside. Not far from there, this home collapsing. Search and rescue teams working to lift and stabilize it, finally finding the homeowner inside who sadly did not survive. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro issued a 10-day ban on social media platform X in the country, saying it had been used to incite violence following the country's presidential election. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro issued a 10-day ban on social media platform X in the country on Thursday, saying it had been used to incite violence following the country's presidential election. This comes after the country's electoral authority proclaimed Maduro winner of the July 28th presidential election, although it has yet to produce tallies proving he'd won what they say was 51% of the vote. He earlier criticized platform owner Elon Musk on state TV. Elon Musk! Elon Musk is the owner of X and has violated all the rules of the social network Twitter itself, today known as X. He has violated the rules by inciting hatred, fascism, civil war, death, confrontation of Venezuelans, and has violated all Venezuelan laws. Get up! Get up, Elon Musk! Get up! The quarrel between Maduro and Musk has grown since the vote. Maduro blames the owner of X for being the driving force behind post-election protests and dissent, while Musk has compared the Venezuelan president to a donkey, and both of them have offered and accepted challenges to fight each other in comments on X and on Venezuelan state television. The ban is another big swipe at big tech from Maduro this week, after he urged supporters to ditch WhatsApp in favor of Telegram or WeChat. He claimed WhatsApp was being used to threaten the families of soldiers and police officers. Meanwhile, on Thursday, foreign ministers of Brazil, Mexico and Colombia repeated their calls for Venezuela's electoral body to release polling records for last month's disputed election. The US, Argentina and Chile have refused to recognize Maduro's claimed victory. Police launched a manhunt in Barcelona for fugitive Charles Puigdemont, a celebrated campaigner for Heartland Independence, who made a sensational return to Spain and an equally sensational getaway from a speech in the city with the alleged help of a local police officer. Spanish police set up roadblocks outside Barcelona in an effort to catch Catalonia's most wanted man. Earlier Thursday, Carlos Puigdemont appeared at a rally in Barcelona for the first time in seven years of self-imposed exile. 
There, the Catalan separatists delivered a short speech, cheered on by thousands of supporters calling for independence. Despite their efforts, despite wanting to hurt us deeply, despite us having seen their repressive face, today we've come here to remind them that we are still here. We are still here. And we're still here because we don't have the right to give up. Moments later, Carlos Puigdemont walked off stage and promptly disappeared, allegedly with the help of a local police officer and under the noses of the 300-strong police force that had gathered near the Catalan parliament to arrest him. The former Catalan leader has spent the last few years on the run in Belgium and France after the Spanish courts declared Catalonia's 2017 independence referendum illegal. The Spanish parliament passed an amnesty law in May pardoning those involved in the failed succession bid, but the Supreme Court upheld an arrest warrant for Puigdemont for embezzlement related to the vote. The Catalan leader staged his comeback on the day that Catalonia's parliament voted for a new president. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. Rituals is a theme of this year's Edinburgh International Festival. Celebrating its 77th anniversary, the annual event was established in 1947 in the aftermath of World War II. The festival is about presenting large-scale music, theatre, opera and dance. This year's edition has over 40 different nations representing and 2,000 or more artists. The festival itself kicks off with a site-specific experience called Where to Begin, which the festival website says will encourage audiences to summon their festive spirit. The Edinburgh International Festival 2024 runs until the 25th of August. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin, wrapping up the week. We will see you again on Monday with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as Vinod Varun Surya will join you next with the nightly business report. Thank you for watching. Good night.